to our penultimate CS111 together. Uh, I have a collection of uh, critters for you to start off today. First is the belted kingfisher. As the name suggests, it will dive down into the water and uh, fish itself a, a small fish to eat. Also have this uh, bull snake uh, sensing the air with its, its black tongue there. Uh, fortunately, not a, not a venomous or, or, or aggressive snake, these bull snakes. Uh, this here is a common loon, but it's less than a, a year old, which is why it doesn't look like uh, you might expect a common loon to look like you will, you will hear these on some some Midwest lakes, they have a very, very distinctive call, also on the, the Canadian uh, uh, coin. Uh, next, we have a, a great horned owl, uh, very large and the, the most kind of widespread uh, owl in, in North America, I, I believe, here staring down the, the photographer. Uh, we have the uh, Harris's sparrow. Uh, this may not uh, look like a very exciting bird, but let me tell you, it was a tremendous deal. So many people, this, this sparrow like was hanging out in my parents' backyard and they just had people from all uh, around like coming to their house because this sparrow isn't usually in Washington state. And so this was really exciting that a Harris's sparrow, I mean, to me, it looks like a, a small brown bird, but uh, birders are, are a unique species all, all to their own. Uh, then we have some, some not birds, again, a, a collection of painted turtles uh, trying to enjoy the sun on, on a log here. Uh, and last but not least, um, uh, pileated uh, woodpecker, one of the larger woodpeckers with uh, it's a distinctive red crest. I lied, not the last one. Last is a pair of trumpeter swans, large, uh, large, elegant birds, but you really don't want to get too close to these these guys, particularly when, when nesting. Uh, they'll, they'll hiss at you, and if you get close enough, they will charge at you and start start pecking at you, which, um, yeah, don't want, to, don't want to get bitten by a swan. All right, any questions about uh, final project, uh, any of the Python stuff we've been looking at to get us started? Well, you, uh, you know me, this is the, the last chance I, I have to uh, subject you, I mean assist you with practice problems. So we'll start out with some of those, and for these, going back to our, our fundamentals, we're focusing on the, the skills that I, I really hope you uh, end 111 feeling uh, like you have, have mastered uh, uh, reading code uh, and recognizing what uh, what is going to do with some of the, the core things like functions and, and loops. So we'll start out with this one here. What's going to be printed by uh, when we call G, uh, F of G of 3, print what that returns. There's some other print statements in here. So uh, take a minute and and work through what you think this code will print. All right, some different thoughts on this one. Please discuss with your neighbors why you think uh, it will print the one you chose. So movement towards C, it's good news. That's what this will, uh, this will print. Uh, which, uh, where, which line is the six being printed by? Someone share that with us, Jonathan? Uh, line six. Exactly, when we call g of three, we then call f of three, that returns three times two, and we'll print six. And then where is the 10 being printed? Gabe? Line three. Uh, line three is never going to execute. Because when we return from a function that ends the function, we never keep going after that. So line three is actually uh, bad style. You would never have code. Uh, like it's just, uh, the, the term that's often used for this is dead code. It's code that will never be executed because 
the function will always return before it gets to that line. So it's not line three. So what's, yeah, Shoko? Yeah, it's when g of three returns three plus two is five, then we call f with five of its parameter, it returns five times two, which is 10, which then gets printed out. Any questions on this one? This is one of the first things that we, we did in class, functions and, uh, and arithmetic. So let's move on to the next things we looked at, lists and loops. So consider this code and what's going to be printed out when we uh, print nums at the end. All right. A and D seem to be the popular ones. Discuss with your neighbors. It's going to be one of those or maybe something else. So maybe a few more people for, for A. This indeed will be, will be A. Uh, why is nums not, not being changed by this code? Emma. Because we set temp equal to nums in the beginning, and then we use temp to, oh, sorry. Confusing. Marcus? I think it's because nums as like the variables never change, but other variables like use nums, but it doesn't change nums itself. Yeah, that's, that's the right idea, that when we say, for num in nums, this is like we said uh, that if we unroll this loop, it's like we said the first time the loop goes around, num equals nums at zero. And then inside the loop, we have num equals prev. And yeah, exactly. Our nums is not being, we're changing what the variable num is, but this was just previously assigned to something from the list. It's not connected to that. It's different slots in, in memory. So we're changing the slot that's labeled num, not any of the slots in, inside our list. Does that make sense? Questions on that? So... Maybe this, this next one will, will clarify this. How about this loop? Uh, what will this end up printing? Yeah, this, uh, the, the majority has it, has it right here that this loop will actually change our list because now instead of changing our loop variable num, we're changing something at index i of of nums on this this line here will actually change what's what's in our list uh, and we had this kind of loop a loop over the elements of our list the kind of loop where we have for i and range of the length of numbers that's our loop over the indexes of our list. And if we want to change the list, we need to use a loop over indexes. All right, now let's take a look at uh, while loops and strings, as well as getting user input. So the, the input function prints out a prompt to the user and then waits for the user to enter some, some input. So, Take a look at this, these three lines and think about how you would describe what this code is doing. All right, I think this will be a, a good one for, to discuss with your neighbors, how uh, you, I, I would focus on what these conditions mean about when we'll get past the loop, when we'll stop repeating the loop. All right, lots of movement toward D. But that's not the right answer. It will be C, because we, if we think about what will be true when we don't repeat the loop, because this code is going to keep asking the user for an answer, 
until that while condition is false. Only when the while condition is false will we not ask the user for, for another answer. So the while condition is determining under what conditions we repeat. And so when we ask what is it ensuring, we're going to repeat if our answer, the length of the answer is less than two. So we're not going to get past the while loop until the answer is longer than that. Uh, it's also checking that the answer is not all letters. And so we'll repeat if that's the case, if it's not all letters. So only when it is at least to length and contains all letters will both parts of this condition be false, which will let us not repeat the loop. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Sure. So what would happen, anyone have an idea of what would happen if we replaced the or with an and? Becca? It would, we would have to have both of them to be true, so it would have to be less than two and it would have to be a number for it to ask for another answer. Um, so for example, like if you had a really long answer with a number in it, it would not ask for the answer. Yeah, so that's exactly right. That putting or here means that this has to be false. If either of these is true, if either it's too short or we don't or we don't have all letters, the loop's going to repeat. We put an and there, the loop's going to repeat when both of these are true. So as Becca was saying, we could have a long, a whole bunch of numbers as the input, and we wouldn't repeat if we had an and there. So in this case, we probably want want an or. Other questions? All right, last one. Here we have a function called swap, a list of strings, and we call swap. We have a couple prints. What will be printed? All right, please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about uh, the swap function and uh, what it's going to do to the list. Uh, we're, we're all thinking B. That's great. That's what's going to happen. Uh, can someone tell us why none is going to be printed out? Yeah. It doesn't return anything. What doesn't return anything? Uh, swap. In order to call, everyone printing swap. Yeah, we call swamp, print the swap, print the return value. There's no return, so that return value is none. And it doesn't seem like swap actually swaps anything, because our list ends up hoopla, hue and cry, kerfuffle, hue and cry. These all are actual things that, that people, people say. These, I didn't make these up. Um, so why, why doesn't swap, like what is swap actually doing? It's not swapping, yeah, redacted. It swaps another swap the back, right? It makes what the index. Or it doesn't swap. Um, like it makes one at I, one at J, but then it changes that back with the capital. Yeah, I mean that's what it's trying to do. Oh. But this set, but we already changed the one at I to B J. Yeah. So that second line is saying like the one at J actually equals the one at J because we just changed I to be the one at J. Uh, so. If we wanted to actually swap two variables, what would we need to change about this? Is that right? Add like a temporary variable. Yeah, we could add a temporary variable. So we uh, save the uh, uh, va the old value at index i, so we can use it uh, to change j. We can Python. Uh, because it's fancy, actually, we can use the multiple assignment to do a swap. Uh, we can say uh, list i comma list j equals list j comma 
list i. So this basically makes a tuple of these two and then puts the first thing in the tuple in i, the second thing in j. So most programming languages don't allow this syntax, but Python lets us be tricky and do this swap in, in this single assignment. All right. We are done with the cards for all eternity. Brian? Uh, does it only work for two things? Uh, no, you could have any number of things uh, on each side, as long as they're the same number. OK, so a few other things on the agenda today. Uh, since this is the end of CS111 and CS111 uh, is the, the, the gateway to all other things computer science uh, at Carleton. I thought I'd briefly talk about how uh, the CS major works, uh, just because it's a little different from uh, uh, a number of other majors on campus in a way that can be a little surprising. So CS111 can go, uh, there are two CS courses you can take having taken 111. Uh, the most frequent one is 201, data structures. Uh, there's a couple sections, uh, at least a couple sections of that every term. And uh, this is digging into a lot of details about how do we actually structure data in a way that's efficient, thinking very carefully about what operations we want to do on that, and we did a little bit of that when we talked about how do we provide uh, a like voter, uh, a, a campaign volunteer database, and we wanted to be able to look up things in it and change things in it, remove things from it. So we had this set of operations, talked about we could do this using a list of tuples, but there were some problems with that. And then there was this dictionary powered by this thing called hashing that actually let us do it efficiently. And 201 is, is kind of asking those kind of questions about all sorts of different, uh, different situations. Uh, the other course that requires uh, 111 is CS202, Math of CS. Uh, this is often called discrete math in, uh, uh, at other, other schools. And this class can also be, uh, you can take math 236 instead. You basically take CS202 or Math 236, up to you. Uh, and this is kind of approaching it from, uh, as the name suggests, the mathematical side, uh, looking at how can we, in a rigorous and mathematical way, understand the kinds of data we're working with and uh, uh, the operations on those. Once you take 201, Almost every other CS course, you have all the prerequisites for it, um, which is kind of the unusual thing. So there's uh, other required courses for the major, 208, 251, 257. 201 is the only prerequisite for those. 208, uh, Introduction to Computer Systems. Uh, looking at what actually happens in the computer when you run a program. 251, programming languages. How do you actually uh, code up something like the Python programming language? Like, how does that actually work? Uh, that's 251. 257 is software design. How do we actually design good software that's accessible, uh, that's easy to uh, modify and, and maintain? 202, the prerequisite for the two theoretical courses in the major. So there's 252, uh, algorithms. This is kind of, th th this is the course that's all about that sort of big O analysis that we were doing. If we have an algorithm, we want to understand uh, what are its properties, how efficient is it, uh, and in 252, we don't want to just sort of count things up. We want, you'll be actually proving things uh, like doing mathematical proofs to show that, that certain algorithms are certain efficiency. And then the other is 254 called computability and complexity or comp and comp. Uh, this is 
kind of the, the biggest theoretical questions in computer science. What does it mean to compute something? Uh, how do we define computation? It, are all problems computable? What kind of problems? Is it impossible to use a computer to solve? Uh, things like that. Uh, and so the CS major is take all of these courses and then two electives. The electives vary from year to year. Typically, electives are offered every other year. Um, and they're largely broken down into categories of understanding different ways that uh, computer systems or software actually work, whether that's networks or operating systems or databases. Uh, there are a number of electives focused on the visual or human side of computing, uh, graphics, data visualization, human-computer interaction. Uh, there are a few courses uh, about how computers uh, think, whether it's uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, computational models of cognition. There's now a machine learning class uh, as well. Uh, I don't. Computational biology uh, is like an interdisciplinary uh, uh, field. So there's there is a computational biology elective, uh, but the broader field of computational biology touches on uh, AI, data mining, databases, uh, and so on. And then there are a few theoretical uh, uh, CS electives, uh, advanced algorithms, and quantum computing being the two that are offered this year. Uh, so that's my, my summary of the, the CS major. Any questions about that? Sammy? So I know that uh, there was this one class uh, that I was really interested in taking, but I don't know uh, how often they offer it. It's called artificial intelligence. I know that we don't have it this year. Is, are we going to have it next year, or is it like two or three years taking? Uh, so I think the the CS2321 artificial intelligence is actually offered this term. Um, it actually is the class that is typically in this room right before us. Um, uh, so that means that it's unlikely to be offered next year. So it'll probably be offered again in two years. Uh, but for example, the machine learning class, which is sort of a, a part of AI, is not offered this year, and so it will likely be offered next year. Other questions? Is there Maybe. a set number of electives uh, you have to take? Yes, you have to take two electives for the major. Um, there are some OCS programs that involve taking a bunch of CS courses, and those will satisfy the elective requirement as well. And comps, like all majors, is the, the last part. All right, last thing on my uh, agenda for today before we have uh, a bit of time left over for final project work is just to, to show some fun things we can do with, with computing, both that, that I've done um, and others have done. So one thing that I did uh, as an undergraduate is uh, got involved in a, a computer modeling uh, uh, project. And specifically, there was a professor in the geosciences uh, geology department who studied the moon of Jupiter, Europa. And Europa has um, uh, a kind of icy uh, crust and uh, data uh, indicates that it has a vast uh, liquid water ocean beneath this icy crust. And in fact, there's as much liquid water on, uh, there, there's more liquid water on Europa than there is on Earth, uh, uh, scientists think. And so one unfortunate thing about Europa is it is very far away. Jupiter is not close. Uh, and so it's very difficult to gather data about things on the surface of, of Europa because you have to send uh, a spacecraft that takes years and quite a lot of money to, to, to get there. So you might want to have computer simulations 
of processes that occur on the surface of Europa. One of those might be some comet smashing into the surface of Europa. This is a kind of has potential um, implications for uh, life on, in these oceans of Europa. Like how, basically the, the main question being, could these comets penetrate this icy crust and expose the ocean? Could they kind of mix things together? Could they introduce stuff into the oceans? And so what we did was uh, take this uh, computer code that had its genesis in like 1950s or 60s simulations of nuclear explosions um, because it turns out the high energy physics of an atomic bomb are not that different from the high energy physics of some massive object smashing into a moon. Uh, and so this code was in a, a venerable programming language called Fortran. Uh, I, I hope that, that none of you have the, have the pleasure of ever working in Fortran, but uh, it, is, it, it can be a fairly efficient language. Uh, and the output of uh, these simulations is something like this, where uh, there's the comet here, and it's been set up to impact this icy crust at a certain speed. The color over here is the temperature. So this red down here is uh, liquid water and uh, the icy crust is coldest at the top and gets warmer. And this is a two kilometer wide icy ball smashing into a moon that maybe had 20 kilometers of crust before, uh, uh, before it got to water. And the other thing to know is that the actual simulation is only one half of this, and then it's just mirrored to give it the appearance of, of the, full, the full thing. And so it smashes into the surface, and you see that there's these kind of, uh, you can see like how far out the debris fall from the impact, and you can see that it does actually penetrate all the way to the liquid ocean, and you would also expect kind of liquid, uh, uh, kind of outflow from the impact site to kind of wash over the surface to uh, to some distance like uh, uh, 40 kilometers out from the point of impact and you can take the results of this kind of simulation and compare them to features that we have ha taken pictures of on the surface of Europa to say do we see anything that is consistent with this sort of behavior would give evidence that maybe the crust is 20 kilometers thick if an impact like this would generate a feature that we that we see. So since it's just a simulation, it uh, things do not always go according to plan. Uh, and so sometimes the simulations start normal and then get very, very strange as the entire moon begins to disintegrate. Um, and because it's just a simulation, if there's if you've made some if you have a bug in like the property of the ice or how certain forces are being uh, uh, simulated, you can get really strange strange behavior out of a model. So that's the sort of CS applied to some other scientific question, like uh, what happens when a comet slams uh, slams into a moon. Uh, another project that I've worked on is creating an educational programming game called Dragon Architect uh, with the idea of let's make a game that can introduce some computational ideas, things like uh, following a set of instructions, loops, procedures, these sort of ideas to, uh, us, uh, say, students in middle school. Um, and the other part of this is what if we uh, could make this uh, such that it would be kind of appealing or interesting to a very wide range of, of people. So uh, our observation was, you know, Minecraft, that's pretty appealing to a wide range of people. So why don't we make a game where you can both move uh, something around using code uh, Tell it to move forward, tell it to move forward and, and turn right. But where well, you can also put down cubes and thus you can have an environment where uh, you're writing code to control a little, uh, a little dragon uh, in 3D and, ha and you're able to tell it to, to build things. 
And what made this a research project was that if you have a game like this and you get some people playing it, you can have people actually play different versions of the game. You can have people play a version where loops come before procedures or one where procedures come before loops uh, or one where the player has certain kind of debugging tools available to them and one where they don't. And you can start to ask questions about what is the most effective way to introduce these computational ideas uh, to, uh, to people who are learning programming for the first time. And so this is using CS to build a game, but for the purpose of learning about how best to teach people. Uh, and this is actually a number of the projects that, that I've worked on have had this focus of let's use uh, data collected by a game or some sort of uh, thing that people are doing on a computer to better understand human behavior or how people learn or what makes people uh, experts at some, at some hard task. And students at, at Carleton, both in, in comps teams and uh, uh, over the summer, have worked on, on Dragon Architect. Uh, this, uh, this version you're seeing here was one that was created by uh, a couple of students um, uh, last summer, uh, basically updating it from the uh, horrors of 2016 web development to actually use modern and, and less um, messy and undocumented uh, uh, structures. Uh, the last thing that uh, I thought would be fun to look at was uh, this term machine learning already came up. So uh, this is the idea of using some statistical model or, or other algorithm to give a computer a bunch of examples of, for example, a bunch of photos with hands at either kind of palm out or fist or scissors so the computer can learn to recognize which pictures correspond to uh, rock, paper, or scissors. Uh, and that means that, uh, no, I didn't want this one. This other one was seems slightly better. So I can attempt to play it. So I can say scissors, and I figure that out, and say paper, but I thought it was rock. And it turns out that it learned to recognize paper uh, by, I think, the back of the hand. Nope, this thing is always rock. <laughs> that one I thought was maybe scissors. There we go. Got it to sit, figure out paper. <laughs> so. The model isn't, isn't perfect, but it's using properties of the pixels in the image to recognize um, uh, uh, which, uh, which position the hand is in. Uh, the other, uh, other fun one is that uh, you can give one of these models pictures of a bunch of different objects and try to train it to uh, be able to recognize uh, objects in some, in some image. And so this one is saying it's 90% sure that there's a person in this section. Zoom this in. Uh, if I bring my phone into the picture, it's thinking that it's, uh, it does think it's a cell phone, actually. Right, it's pretty sure that it's a cell phone, but this has decreased its confidence that there's also a person. Um, uh, some things it might not be as good at recognizing. Oh, figured out that was a cup. but. If it doesn't see the handle, it might think it's, yeah, sometimes, oh, before, if it saw this, it's definitely sure that there's a bowl or a Frisbee on my shirt. Um, anyway, so I thought, I thought that's, that's sort of a, a fun example of you're giving a computer some set of data to, to train it to recognize certain things. What is this thing that it's actually using for this? Uh, it's something called a, a neural network. Um, and the basic idea uh, is that each pixel of the image gets fed in as one input 
to this network. And then this network is made up of a bunch of boxes that take in some number of inputs and then produce an output that could go one or many places. And all that a box is doing is applying some simple mathematical function. So uh, in this example, applying uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, tangent function to, to the input. Uh, and then each of these connections between the boxes gets multiplied by some number. And the way that this network learns is by adjusting all those numbers that get multiplied on these connections. And so basically, the pixels of the image goes, goes input, they're turned into numbers, these numbers flow through other points in this network until we finally get to a final output that is like telling us the category that it thinks the object in the image is. And so if you have a lot of data and a powerful computer or a lot of time, you can kind of, through trial and error, learn the right kind of numbers to multiply on all, these, on all these connections, the right kind of functions to apply to all the inputs to get good, good results out. The downside is that when you have this final network, you have no earthly idea what it's doing. So it's like a bunch of numbers on connections, these mathematical functions. There's not sort of an intuitive understanding of, of the neural network. Um, and uh, I'll post the link to this, uh, to this playing around because you can kind of play with the, the structure of the network and the functions and everything, and then you can see how it learns over time uh, how to classify the, the, the data points. Um, which is just a yeah a very a very cool little demo of of how our neural network works. All right, that was my uh, uh, blitz through beyond CS one eleven. Uh, so we'll use the rest of our our time today for final project uh, work. So Dominic and I will be uh, around if you have any any questions um, on Friday. Uh, we'll. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to ask me anything, CS or, or otherwise, so come with your, your questions, uh, and then we'll also do some surveys, and that uh, and we'll have time for, for final project work as well. Um, but for now, uh, that, will, that will do it for today, so and, uh, uh, work on your final projects, and uh, we'll be around.